For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? Sent to re remove Mr. Corhalva as a co-sponsor from HCON Resolution 107. Without objection. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the House is not in order. That is correct. The House is not in order. The House is not in order. The gentlewoman may proceed. Madam Speaker, for the purpose of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. During consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purpose of debate only. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. So ordered. Madam Speaker, House Resolution 656 provides for closed rule providing for consideration of H.R. 4970, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, and general debate for H.R. 4310, the National Defense Authorization Act, for fiscal year 2013. Madam Speaker, as an original co-sponsor of the underlying bill, I'm proud to stand with my Republican colleagues in support of the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women, otherwise known as VAWA. The House Judiciary Committee past version, past version of VAWA before us today is a common sense proposal to ensure that limited taxpayer dollars are used responsibly and efficiently while also improving access to services for victims. With this bill, we have also worked to add accountability requirements to conduct necessary oversight of VAWA grant recipients and programs. Our goal is to ensure that more money is spent on direct services and less on administrative bureaucracy. I commend Representative Adams on authoring this legislation and urge my colleagues to vote yes on the rule and the underlying bill. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from North Carolina reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Uh, I thank the gentlelady for yielding me the customary 30 minutes, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the rule and the underlying bills, H.R. 4970, the Cantor-Adams Bill, and H.R. 4310, the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, before we discuss the unprecedented rule for Cantor-Adams Bill, uh, which has really turned what has traditionally been a bipartisan issue into political football, uh, to the detriment of uh, women across our country. I would like to say a few words about the National Defense Authorization Act, which is also included in this rule. Uh, I'm really dismayed that the defense authorization bill that House Republicans have brought before us undermines the bipartisan agreement which was reached just last summer. The bill funds defense spending at $8 billion over the level set in the Budget Control Act and $3 billion over the President's budget request. Again, more deficit spending in this Republican bill before us under this rule. As our deficit spirals out of control, we need to tighten our belt and balance our budget. Instead, this bill doubles down on 10 years of ballooning defense budgets, which have played a major role in our deficit. This bill continues to kick the can down the road towards balancing our budget and leaves an only bigger hole that the Republican tax and spend policies continue to dig our nation deeper and deeper in debt. Additionally, this bill ties the hand of our military and law enforcement by requiring in statute to keep military detainees in Guantanamo, uh, handcuffing any president, Democrat or Republican, and preventing them uh, from coming up with a plan with, for what to do with these individuals. Uh, this bill panders to our fears by insisting that the detainees remain in Guantanamo 
interminably and tries to tell generals how to do their job and sets a timetable for troop levels in Afghanistan rather than our normal civilian process. Finally, I'm disappointed by the political posturing included in the bill. The NDAA used to, used to focus solely on setting defense policy and protecting our nation. Unfortunately, uh, the Republicans have decided to use this bill to also push political wedge issues. There's language in this bill prohibiting the use of military facilities to conduct same-sex marriages, even in states that allow same-sex marriages, uh, even preventing gay and lesbian chaplains uh, from marrying uh, members of the military uh, to, to other members of the military. Further, I'm deeply disturbed that in a bill that governs our national security, language was included that would increase our dependence on foreign oil and undermine our long-term energy security interests. This bill's exemption of the Department of Defense from complying with Section 526 of the 2007 Energy Bill hurts water and recreation interests in my state and harms research and development and investment in renewable energy. Now, sadly, as, as, as disappointing it is to see political posturing in the defense authorization bill under this rule, it's truly horrifying to see the political posturing and the provisions of the Violence Against Women Act, which under this House version would likely lead to more violence against women. Violence Against Women Act has a long bipartisan history. Uh, both sides have traditionally sought to protect all victims of domestic violence, not just some. Sadly, this bill before us undoes much of the work that previous Congresses have done and accomplished on this issue for no reason when we have a bipartisan Senate version of the bill that protects all women from abuse from partners. Why would we exclude, exclude certain women in this country? If a woman's in a lesbian relationship with another woman, should she be not protected if she's a, a victim of domestic abuse? If a woman doesn't have the, the documentation to be in this country and whose presence is, 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 is here illegally, should she not be protected under this law? VAWA protects women that are actually convicted of other crimes. If a woman stole a car and served time, was convicted of that crime, she's still uh, protected from domestic abuse under VAWA. And that nonviolent offenders of our civil code, like undocumented immigrants, would no longer be protected because they would effectively face deportation after four years for testifying against the perpetrator of their abuse, making it much less likely that they would bring the perpetrator to justice and end the vicious cycle of domestic abuse in their family. The majority of the House has offered no explanation for their refusal to allow us to take up the Senate bipartisan bill. My colleague Virginia Fox was noncommittal in her response about whether we would be taking up the Senate bipartisan bill. And if, if she doesn't know the answer, and I certainly take her on the word, I would hope that somebody on the other side can come to the floor and say, can we take up the Senate bipartisan bill? And if not, why not? And if so, when? It passed the Senate with 68 votes, Republicans and Democrats. And uh, this is the time to stand up and see if our colleagues on both sides of the aisle are serious about responding to the insidious domestic violence crimes that occur every day throughout this country. And frankly, that could start by the defeat of this bill and allow an open process for considering this bill on the floor of the House. I reserve the balance of my time. General reserves balance of time. Like Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield two minutes to the distinguished woman from Kansas, Ms. Jenkins. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. The Violence Against Women's Act is an important tool for preventing domestic violence and sexual assault and supporting the victims of these crimes. There is broad bipartisan agreement that this essential legislation must be renewed. While the House bill protects the victims of domestic violence and improves services and education to prevent and address these crimes on college campuses, our legislation also goes beyond the Senate bill by ensuring taxpayer resources help victims, not Washington bureaucrats, by limiting administrative expenses, requiring annual audits, and combating fraud. While the House legislation takes enormous strides in protecting the victims of these truly horrific crimes, the legislation also takes great care to ensure the funds allocated by this bill are treated with the responsibility and care the victims and taxpayers deserve.
H.R. 4970 requires VAWA audits be performed by the Department of Justice and that the Attorney General improves the coordination between the grant-making offices to reduce duplication and overlap in funding. H.R. 4970 prohibits the award of grant funds to nonprofit organizations that hold money in offshore accounts in order to avoid paying their federal taxes, and it limits the use of funds for salaries and administrative expenses to 5% of funds authorized under the Act. The Violence Against Women's Act has bipartisan support in both the House and Senate, and any attempt to exploit this important law as partisan political issue is contemptible. I encourage my colleagues in the House to vote in support of this legislation today to protect the victims of violent crime and support the responsible stewardship of taxpayer dollars. I yield back. Gen the gentleman from North Carolina. Colorado. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Colorado, Ms. DeGette. The gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For nearly two decades, Congress has repeatedly reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act on a near-unanimous bipartisan basis. Since the act became law, incidents of domestic violence have dropped by more than 60 percent, and the reporting rate of domestic violence has risen by 51 percent. The 2012 reauthorization is a chance for Congress to reaffirm its commitment to protection of women across this nation. That is why it's particularly disheartening to see such a vital piece of legislation fall victim to putting politics ahead of people. What are the facts? Tonight, an American woman will join the one in four women who have been the victims of severe physical domestic violence. To her, this re reauthorization is more than just a bill, it's security. The bill is security for the one in six women who have been raped in their lifetime. It's security for the mothers, daughters, and sisters across this nation. And it's security for the selfless individuals who tirelessly work to bring aid. Now is not the time to take a step back to abandon these victims. This Congress must expand its efforts and ensure that all victims are assisted, no matter what their race, religion, or sexual orientation. Yet too many in this body have chosen to fight against these protections. They want to fight efforts to extend LGBT lit lit individuals equal protection, even though they're less likely to receive protective orders, more likely to be turned away, and because of this are less likely to report their attack to the police. They deserve equal protection, and there's a bipartisan bill that does just that, but it's falling victim to electioneer politics. In America, we have to combat the abuse of women in our own society, no matter their country of origin, if we are going to continue to have the moral authority to advocate for the rights of people abroad. And there's a bipartisan bill that would continue to protect immigrant survivors by granting them special visas and by preventing retribution from their attackers. Yet there are some in this body who would also deny these women protection. These days, Bipartisan compromise is hard to come by, no matter how hard some of us try. We are rarely handed an opportunity where there is such universal agreement. VAWA has a proud history of bipartisan support. Let's continue that tradition, put politics aside, and pass a bipartisan VAWA reauthorization bill that protects all victims. I yield back. The gentleman from Colorado reserves. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield two minutes to my colleague from North Carolina, Congresswoman Elmers. Thank you, and thank you to my colleague and my lady from North Carolina. North Carolina is recognized. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I rise in support of the rule and the underlying bill and call for the passage of H.R. 4970, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2012. Since its enactment in 1994, VAWA has helped many women escape abuse and enabled them to seek help through its Victim Services Program. 
We are here today debating something that is a good policy and common sense and should be supported in the same bipartisan manner that we have seen throughout the two decades that is in, since its inception. Violence against women does not occur along party lines and neither should reauthorization of these programs. We must work together in a bipartisan manner to protect women from domestic violence, rape, and stalking. Partisan posturing should not be placed above the urgent needs of these victims. The House's reauthorization makes several key improvements to the Senate bill and nearly doubles the resources for eliminating the backlog of unprocessed rape evidence kits while cracking down on the fraud identified in the immigration program. This bill also brings great accountability to the grant administration by ensuring that funding is spent on the victims, not Washington bureaucrats. The House's, House's reauthorization of VAWA is and always will be about the victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. I am proud to support this bill and will continue to fight and protect women and victims of abuse through common sense legislation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from North, uh, North Carolina reserves and the gentleman from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one and a half minutes to the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized for one and a half minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the rule and urge a no vote on the flawed Violence Against Women Act that my Republican colleagues will bring to the floor. They had an opportunity to bring the bipartisan Senate bill to the floor but chose not to do so. And that's a shame because the Violence Against Women Act has been a bipartisan a non-controversial effort for almost 20 years now. The update passed the Senate on a bipartisan basis just last month. Why does everything have to be a partisan fight here on the floor of the House? Over the past year, my Republican colleagues here in the House have blocked an important jobs package. They have stalled the adoption of the National Transportation and Infrastructure Bill. They've dragged their feet on help for students and the impending increase to the student loan rate. And now they have turned what has been a bipartisan effort to protect the victims of domestic violence into a senseless political fight. Republicans would not even allow debate on amendments so that we could improve their flawed bill. And this is serious because in my home state of Florida there were over 113,000 crimes of domestic violence reported in 2010. If the Republican bill were to pass, more domestic violence crimes would go unreported, more abusers would be free, and more victims would be harmed. This bill works in opposition to the very purpose of the legislation to protect all victims of domestic violence, not just some victims, all victims. And advocates across the country who are on the front lines and aiding women and victims every day have announced their opposition. Please defeat this rule so we can call up the bipartisan improved version from the Senate. Thank you. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would now like to uh, give one minute to the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. The gentlelady from Tennessee is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank you for the time and I take, thank the gentlewoman from North Carolina for her leadership on the rule. And I also want to thank uh, Sandy Adams, Congresswoman Adams from Florida, for her leadership on the issue. I think it is so instructive to all of us as women of the House that we have had a female law enforcement officer who has been a leader in domestic violence policy in addressing this issue to help walk us through what works, what doesn't, where we need to tweak this. Many members of this House, many women are like me. They've worked on establishing domestic violence and child advocacy centers. And to hear from Congresswoman Adams the specifics and to bring more accountability to bear and to make certain that funding gets to the victims is it has been her priority and job well done on that. Some of the stats indeed tell us why we need to do this. In Tennessee where I'm from, 52.1 percent of all crimes against person are domestic violence. So I urge support for the rule. I yield back the balance of my time. Yields back to the balance. Gentleman from Colorado. 
Virginia. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Caps. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for two minutes. I thank my colleague. Ms. Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the rule and to the underlying bill that will actually roll back protections for women across this nation. The Violence Against Women Act is a vital piece of legislation, to be sure. It established a comprehensive response to prevent relationship violence, sexual assault, and stalking, to support survivors, to hold perpetrators accountable. But it is also a symbol that relationship violence and sexual assault is real and that it is unacceptable. And for the past 20 years, this law has been a shining symbol that Congress can put aside its petty differences and we can come together to do what is right for violence victims and survivors. Now the bill before us tarnishes that symbol. H.R. 4740 marks a backsliding in violence protections, leaving more women out in the cold without legal resources or social supports just when they need it most. And the issues are not just for immigrants or the LGBT community, although the way the bill before us ignores their pain is shameful, but also for women on college campuses, those in need of safe housing, tribal women. And that is why hundreds of groups across the country, service providers, law enforcement, health care workers, have come out against this bill. Now, we could address the problems in this bill if we were allowed an opportunity to vote on the Moore Conyers Amendment, which I co-sponsored. The Moore Conyers Amendment mirrors the recently passed bipartisan Senate bill, but the House leadership unilaterally decided to block it from even coming to a vote. The majority has once again put rigid ideology over common sense compromise, and this time at the expense of violent survivors and their families. Reauthorization is critical for Violence Against Women Act, but it needs to be done right. I urge the majority to drop the partisan politics, join a bipartisan coalition, and support these survivors. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield five minutes to my distinguished colleague on the Rules Committee, Mr. Nugent from Florida. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you. Uh, my fellow Rules Committee member, Dr. Fox, for allowing me to speak on this issue, not only for women, but for all Americans. I also want to thank my Florida colleague, Sandy Adams, for her leadership shown in this issue. You know, I spent my entire career as a law enforcement officer, 36 years, and the last 10 years as a sheriff. And when you're a cop, you usually don't get to see people in the best light. Getting called to somebody's house or somebody coming to your office isn't typically something that is a highlight of their day. It's because they're in need of help. Throughout my entire career, I saw some of the worst that man has to offer. No small part of that was domestic violence. During my four decades as a cop and sheriff, I saw the results of domestic violence. Battered partners, both men and women, children either physically or emotionally hurt by the crossfire between their fighting parents. Victims who are suffering and scared, intimidated, and who didn't know where to go for justice. If you look at the state of Florida and what it did in regards to domestic violence, it's clear that it talks about, it's not about a husband and wife, it's about those folks that live within a home. It's about their relationship within that home, as it affects their children and as it affects each other. It doesn't specifically say that it has to be a man or a woman doesn't identify that. It talks about a relationship, not a casual relationship, but a relationship where, you know, they're intimate with each other. They spend time with each other. They're sexually active with each other. It doesn't say that it has to be man and woman. It says these individuals have certain rights under domestic violence law and also the ability to get an injunction for protection. I've seen abusers on both sides. I've seen those that are married, those where the boyfriend and girlfriend, and those that were boyfriend and boyfriend or girlfriend and girlfriend commit atrocious crimes on each other. It had nothing to do with marriage. It had everything to do about relationships they had within their home. So as we move forward, you know, those on the other side of the aisle want to add something to this piece of legislation it's already covered. 
it already covers those relationships. If you start defining a particular relationship, what if you leave one out? Here it's very broad and allows us in law enforcement to be very protective of those that need protection. Whether it's stalking, intimidation, voyeurism, it doesn't matter. And often women are the most victims of domestic violence, but a man can just as easily be a victim of domestic violence, and I've seen that too. The Violence Against Women's Act protects and prevents all types of intimate partner crime, regardless of gender, of either the criminal or the victim. This legislation funds the programs that not only help men and women who've been hurt, but it help, also helps law enforcement prevent these crimes from ever happening. Now, I've heard a number of my colleagues talk about what isn't in the bill. They say, for example, it doesn't include sexual orientation as one of the protected classes. Violent, the Violence Against Women Act is and always been gender neutral. That's the beauty of this piece of legislation. It's gender neutral. Under the real vow, as some people call it, domestic violence is interpreted as intimate partner violence. Legal includes felonies, misdemeanor crimes committed by spouses, ex-spouses, boyfriends or girlfriends, or ex-boyfriends or ex-girlfriends. Now, I'm not going to say this House legislation is perfect, but it makes significant improvements to streamline our nation's domestic violence. In fact, the exact same funding authorization levels in the Senate bill is included in this bill, $680 million per funding year for the next five years. Moreover, the manager's amendment provides, brings the House even more in line with the Senate's authorization. Madam Speaker, you probably know this week is National Police Week, and we certainly know about domestic violence. And the, my men and women that worked for me as a sheriff knew about it. Sandy Adams, is a former cop, introduced this legislation. And we've seen firsthand what domestic violence does to our families. By passing this legislation, we get a step closer to making sure these victims receive the services they need. That's why I'm encouraging my colleagues to support the rule, support this legislation, and let it get to conference with the Senate so we can bring these services to men and women who need it the most. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. DeLauro. Gentlelady from Connecticut is recognized for two minutes. When one out of four women will experience domestic violence in their lifetimes, it is unconscionable that the majority would try to roll back the protections in the Violence Against Women Act. Since the act first passed in 1994, it has changed the landscape for American women. Domestic violence has dropped by over 50 percent. And in a historical bipartisan fashion, the Senate passed a bill that modernizes the act for our times. It consolidates programs, takes additional steps to reach victims of domestic violence. 200 national organizations, 500 state and local organizations, and I include the National District Attorneys Association, the National Sheriff's Association. The colleague who just spoke is a former sheriff, but his association is supporting the Senate bill and not this House bill. The Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association support the Senate bill. And our colleague, Congressman Moore, has put forward legislation that mirrors that bipartisan approach. But instead of moving that bipartisan bill forward, the majority has put forward an alternative bill that in fact risks the lives and the health of women. The Department of Justice estimates that one of every three Native American women will be raped. Two out of five will be victims of domestic violence. The majority's bill removes the provisions that are essential to ensuring that Indian women have access to the act. The Senate bill, Congressman Moore's bill strengthened protections in the act for immigrant women. And yet, 
The majority's bill would endanger the safety of immigrants. In 2010, nearly half of lesbian and gay survivors were turned away from domestic violence shelters or denied the services because of their sexual orientation. The majority's bill would continue to deny those individuals the community protections afforded by the act. We are talking about women's lives. This is no place for partisan gains. The rule before us would roll back a central protection that have made a difference for so many women in this nation. I urge the majority, I, bring Congressman Moore's bill to the floor. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this rule. General Lady from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in support of H.R. 4970, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. <laughs> Domestic violence is an all too common reality occurring most everywhere here in the United States and one that deeply impacts all involved. In Ohio alone, there were reportedly 70,717 calls in 2010 for domestic violence incidents. While not all of these resulted in criminal charges, it is vitally important that law enforcement have the knowledge and resources necessary to appropriately respond and investigate domestic violence calls. It is also crucial that all victims of domestic violence have access to the help they need to get out of a harmful situation and overcome not only physical abuse, but the emotional scars that also deeply impact the lives of victims. I am confident that H.R. 4970 would play an integral role in alleviating domestic violence in our communities by providing more than $680 million in funding per year to help prevent domestic violence and protect victims of abuse. This legislation would also increase resources for sexual assault investigations, prosecutions, and victim services, in addition to strengthening penalties for abusers. Importantly, this legislation also seeks to promote awareness for the prevention of violence by funding state prevention education programs and enhancements for campus programs. As a son, a husband, a brother to two sisters, a father of two grown women, and a grandfather of four little girls, I understand the importance of preventing domestic violence against women and also ensuring that all women have the necessary resources and protection should they ever be in need. The number of occurrences of domestic violence, physical violence, and stalking within the United States is staggering and simply unacceptable. It is my hope that this reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act will have an immediate impact on reducing domestic violence and improving services for its victims. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, uh, it is my honor to yield one minute to the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney. The gentlelady from New York is recognized for one minute. Thank you. I urge a no vote. This bill is but one more assault on what has become sadly but surely known as the war against women. A government has no greater responsibility than to keep its citizens safe. But in its current form, this bill says there are some we will not help, we will not protect. These Native Americans, these LGBT people, these immigrant people. Our, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would not extend the protections of this bill to tribal residents. Why? Do they not suffer when they are assaulted? This bill in its current form would not protect uh, people from discrimination in the LGBT community. Why do they not bleed when they are struck? And this bill in its current form eliminates the path to citizenship for some visa holders who have been victims of sex trafficking, torture, rape. Why do they not bruise and bleed when they are beaten and battered? There is an indifference to the suffering of some, just some. Thank you. There is an indifference to the suffering of some, just some, in this bill that is as chilling and callous as anything I have ever seen in this chamber in modern times. I urge a strong no vote on the rule and the underlying bill. Thank you. Gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Burkle. I thank the gentlelady from North Carolina, and I rise this afternoon in support of the rule and the underlying bill in H.R. 4970. Um, and I am so pleased to stand here with my colleagues in support of this rule. 
This is a particularly meaningful bill for me because in 1994, when I graduated from law school, I uh, became aware of a program that the Women's Bar Association had, and that was 1994, and that's when the original VAWA was enacted. And the program was that we could do pro bono work and work in our domestic violence shelter. So for all of this many years, I have been involved in domestic violence. So it's particularly meaningful to me that the day uh, the time when I first got involved in this, and it was thanks to a very courageous law school professor I had, um, that we now are reauthorizing VAWA, and originally from 1994. I, I, Ms. Madam Speaker, I just become so distressed when I hear the allegations that there is a war on women. When we sat down and we began discussing VAWA, we sat down with the understanding that Americans deserve equal protection under the law. We are not going to single out, we are not going to distinguish one victim from another. Any woman, any person, I should say, who is a victim of domestic violence is a victim of domestic violence. And beyond that, it, is, it should be of no concern. However, I will say this, and, and to my colleague Sandy Adams, who has done such a magnificent job with this, when we began to hear concerns after we dropped this bill last week, we went back to the table. We heard from members who had large Native American populations in their district, members who are Native American with, re with concerns to the Native American issue. We heard with regards to the uh, illegal alien issue. We went back to the table and came forth with a manager's amendment to begin to address those issues. That's the right thing to do. That's what domestic violence victims should expect from this House. Sit down, figure this out, and make sure we go forward with what's in the best interest of the victims, and that's what the House of Representatives did. I uh, strongly support this rule and the underlying bill. I thank and I yield back my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's my honor to yield one minute to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for one minute. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. So, so ordered. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I thank the gentleman. Let me give one example of how important uh, this legislation is and how this bill before us would eliminate important provisions to protect women from abuse. Several years ago, a teenage girl from Trenton came to my office for help. She'd been abused and her parents, by her parents and abandoned by them. When she came to my office, she was living at a shelter, participating in a transitional living program that required part-time employment. She had come to the United States legally, but she needed help. Because of VAWA, I was able to show her how she could secure her permanent resident status and work authorization. After I helped her get work authorization and permanent resident status, she got her life back on track. VAWA made that possible. This bill would remove essential provisions of VAWA that allow victims of abuse to petition for permanent residency by themselves. And thus removing those provisions, this bill would leave this girl and countless other victims of domestic abuse with no help, no support, and potentially at the mercy of their abusers. Vote no on this rule. Vote no on the bill. Gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield two minutes to the distinguished woman from Michigan, Ms. Miller. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. And, Madam Speaker, I rise in support of the rule and in strong support of the underlying bill, the Violence Against Women Act. Madam Speaker, for several years I had the great honor to serve on a board of my local domestic violence, a safe house. And I call it safe house. We didn't call it shelter. We called it a safe house. So I've personally seen women and children who so desperately needed that safe haven to escape from a cycle of violence. And throughout my service here in Congress, I've consistently fought to make certain that support is there for all of the safe houses across my district. Those women and all those victims of domestic violence who far too often suffer in silence need to know that they are not alone, that there are people who care. And today, this House is doing what we need to do by taking a stand in defense of those who face the danger of domestic violence by passing this reauthorization. I certainly applaud the author of the bill, Sandy Adams from Florida, Really, she's kept politics away from crafting this bill. And it's, instead, she's really focused squarely on protecting the victims of domestic violence. The bill that uh, we are debating here today produces funding at the, actually at the same level as what was passed by the Senate, but I think it allocates that funding in a way that better supports the victims of domestic violence. 
for instance this bill doesn't make any special carve outs for any particular victim groups because it protects everybody equally it also includes outstanding revisions developed by listening to those involved in protecting business victims from across the nation it strengthens penalties for sexual assault and abuse it improves federal stalking law it helps young women in college by working to prevent violence on our campuses through improved education program and it dramatically improves emergency and transitional housing services as well the senate bill mirrors current law which only mandates forty percent of the funding in the dna analysis backlog elimination act of uh, two thousand to address a backlog of rape testing kits which are required quite frankly to successfully prosecute rape cases our bill our bill mandates that seventy five percent of the funding be used for that purpose so that we can eliminate the backlog that exists and put rapists where they belong and that's in prison so madam speaker i urge all my colleagues to join me today in standing up for women in need and all victims of violence by supporting this outstanding legislation i yield back the gentleman from colorado is recognized thank you madam speaker i yield two minutes to the gentleman from virginia mr scott Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Madam Speaker, we need to work together to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, but unfortunately, H.R. 4970 is seriously flawed and should not pass. Among its many flaws, it harms immigrant women and fails to protect the LGBT community. It also creates new mandatory minimum sentences. Mandatory minimums have been studied extensively, and they've been found to be ineffective in addressing crime, while at the same time they distort the rational uh, sentencing systems, they discriminate against minorities, and they often violate common sense. Uh, Madam Speaker, mandatory minimums can be particularly harmful in domestic relations cases, uh, domestic violence cases, where the victim and the abuser have a prior relationship and where the victim of abuse may be less likely to report the abuse knowing that if convicted, the abuser was, is certain to go to prison for five or ten years without parole. That's why many organizations dedicated to ending domestic violence and working hard for the reauthorization, reauthorization of our are opposed to the mandatory minimum provisions in the bill. On top of these problems in the reported bill, the Rules Committee adopted a manager's amendment that, among other problems, deletes protections against uh, discrimination in hiring by religious organizations using VAWA funds. Since the 1960s, we have had, as a federal policy, a prohibition against discrimination based on religion when using federal funds. Now, the 1964 Civil Rights Act had an exemption for churches and other religious organizations using their own funds to be able to consider religion and hiring. However, the manager's amendment specifically allows those groups to discriminate based on religion with federal funds. We should not pass a bill that allows a person applying for a job paid for with federal funds to be discriminated against based on religion. Madam Speaker, we must work hard to reauthorize VAWA, but unfortunately, H.R. 4970 in its current form is not the version of our we should pass and the rule does not allow amendments to improve the bill so I urge defeat of this rule. I yield back the balance. Gentleman time. yields back. Gentlelady from North Carolina. Uh, thank you Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield two minutes to our distinguished colleague from Wyoming, Congresswoman Lummis. Gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman, and I rise also to support the rule and to support the Violence Against Women Act. This bill will support programs and organizations that help assist the victims of domestic abuse, stalking, and sexual assault. And it does so in a way that includes much needed accountability measures. So we can be sure that more of the funds go to the victims who need it rather than to Washington bureaucrats. When I was practicing law, I represented uh, some victims of domestic violence, including men, women, and children, uh, when I was doing guardian ad litem work. And I further had a uh, law office bookkeeper who was murdered by her husband while she was working for us. It was traumatic for the entire office. On Indian reservations in my state, and in communities where there is a hidden element of domestic abuse that you see every Friday morning in the courtroom when they have stacked settings for these types of cases, 
you see things you wouldn't even believe are going on in your own communities. That's why it's so important that we have a bill that's efficient and gets the money to those victims, not to bureaucrats in Washington. That's why I support this rule. That's why I support the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, yield one minute and 15 seconds to the gentleman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. Gentlelady from Maryland, for one minute, 15 seconds. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in opposition to the rule in the underlying bill that rolls back protections for domestic violence victims and survivors, and I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record three letters representing hundreds of organizations, law enforcement organizations, advocacy organizations around the country Without in objection. opposition to the rule. Before coming to Congress, I founded and was the first executive director of the National Network to End Domestic Violence. I've trained thousands of police officers and judges, held victims' hands in courts, I've done intake in shelters, and held their children during, in emergency rooms and answered calls on hotlines. This bill, the underlying bill, and the rule do great damage to the work that we've done across the aisle as advocates and leaders of goodwill to protect the interests of battered women, of domestic violence victims and survivors. Since the passage in 1994, the Violence Against Women Act has been a bipartisan piece of legislation. It's revolutionized the way that violent crimes against women are prosecuted and prevented. Never would I have imagined that when working on this 18 years ago that we'd be in this Congress rolling back the protections that have been expanded to protect women, victims, survivors across this country and their children. It really is a sad day in this Congress. We should be ashamed of what we're doing. We should, uh, we should make sure that we expand protections for women, for immigrant women, for lesbian and gay, women, uh, gay men and women, and, and to make sure that we pass a rule that truly is bipartisan in this Congress that reflects the General values and the needs expired. and the spirits of the 1994 And the law. time's expired. And the gentlelady from North Carolina. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now would like to yield one minute to our distinguished colleague from Illinois, Congresswoman Bigger. Gentlelady from Illinois, recognized for one minute. I thank the, I thank the gentlelady for yielding. And Madam Speaker, I am disappointed in this closed rule uh, for VAWA. I am concerned that the bill, even with the changes made in the manager's amendment, doesn't reflect everything that we've learned over the past five years in terms of what works best for victims or prosecutors. Over the past several months, I sat down with the advocates in my district to go section by section through the uh, Senate reauthorization and discuss what works and what doesn't work. They strongly support provisions that would clarify equal treatment treatment for LGBT individuals, bolster enforcement on Native American reservations, and ensure that victims aren't deported simply for reporting domestic abuse. I see no reason to exclude these provisions from a House bill. Our victim uh, service providers uh, on the front lines really uh, just want to know what they ca who they can help and, and uh, that they can help everyone who comes to the front door. Last night I offered an amendment that would have modernized the bill's definitions to inflect the input of victim service providers including special protections for uh, immigrant victims and clarified that LGBT individuals can be served by VAWA. I, I previously worked on the authorizations of VAWA, which incorporated good ideas. That authorization was never a partisan expired. issue, and it shouldn't be now. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett. Gentleman from Texas, for one minute. For so many, this Violence Against Women Act vote is literally a matter of life and death. One immigrant abused by her husband who was a special agent for the Homeland Security Department. He threatened her that she would be deported and separated from her daughter. She sought help anyway at the excellent San Antonio Family Violence Prevention Services, which provided her a special visa, allowing her to remain here safely. Another woman in Austin found death. So fearful of being deported, she was eventually killed in broad daylight in front of her two little children. We have a two-year backlog for this visa. It is a visa that can provide support to families across this country. It is a visa that was approved almost unanimously in a previous Congress. Instead of focusing on a victim's visa status, we should be focused on the fight against domestic violence. Instead of focusing on discriminating against some in our community, 
Instead of Recognize. discriminating against some in our community, we should be focused on ensuring all victims of violence everywhere receive the care and services they need. Let's move forward in that struggle, not take another giant Republican step backward. I yield back. Gentlelady from North Carolina. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to now yield one minute to the distinguished woman from Missouri, Congresswoman Hartzler. Gentlelady from Missouri for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. H.R. 4970 reauthorizes the Violence Against Women Act for another five years, providing important funding for fighting domestic violence and abuse. When Congress reauthorizes any bill, we must make sure that the bill directs resources towards those it is intended to help and makes the best possible use of taxpayer money. That's what we've done in H.R. 4970 by strengthening accountability and transparency in grant administration to ensure that these dollars go to help the victims, not entrenched government bureaucrats. I've been a long supporter of domestic violence shelter in my own hometown. Hope Haven plays an essential role in aiding victims and providing tools for recovery. I've seen the vital work that they do and know that dozens of other organizations like it will benefit from the bill's passage. This isn't a bipartisan, uh, this is a bipartisan bill. It's a reauthorization of longstanding provisions that aid women. And I'm hopeful that my colleagues will join me in supporting its worthwhile efforts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Gentlelady from Texas is recognized for one minute. Point of parliamentary inquiry, I want to make sure that the time has not begun until the gentlelady begins. And the gentleman is correct. Thank you. I yield to the gentlelady from Texas. Gentlelady from Texas for one minute. I thank the gentleman from Colorado, and I sadly rise uh, in opposition to the rule, and I really cry out to ask the question, who should, who should refuse the help of a victim of domestic violence? Who has the right to deny a victim, Native American, immigrant, LGBT community, who has that right? It is obvious that this legislation is not bipartisan, and it is obvious that there is still a divide. It is obvious that the groups who obviously work with these victims, many who I have the opportunity of seeing through the eyes of the women, uh, Houston Area Women's Center, realize that no provider wants to pick and choose. It is clear that the underlying bill does not work. The Senate bill is what answers the question of these victims who now have been harmed, because what you're saying to an immigrant who is here on a U visa, uh, you are saying to them that they have no relief. I believe this bill will not work, and it is really Without question, can I get 10 seconds? Gentle ladies, okay, 10, 10 seconds. Gentle gentle ladies, ladies, recognized for 10 seconds. It really is uh, a question as to whether or not the new included funding for rate kips will actually be able to go to providers and solve the problems of rate kips, rate kits in places around the nation. We need to do this in a bipartisan way. Who will say no to a victim because they're Native American? They are immigrant or they're LGBT. Time's Who will expired. say no? I yield time's back. expired. The gentlelady from North Carolina. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll reserve the balance of my time. Gentlelady reserves. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell. Gentleman from New Jersey, recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. Uh, this bill takes steps backwards from offering full protections for women and children who suffer unspeakable abuse. I'm not questioning the intentions, Madam Speaker, of those on the other side. That's not my purpose here. But who are we excluding today? You're either a unifier on the floor or you are a divider. Instead of passing the bipartisan Senate bill that provides protections for women who are victims of abuse, the majority has decided instead to turn women's safety and security into a political fight. Shouldn't be. 2010, the National Intimate Partner and in Sexual Violence Survey 
An average of 24 people per minute are victims of rape, violence, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. The Violence Against Women Act has made great strides. It shouldn't matter if a woman is an immigrant or a member of the LGBT community. I, I'm against this rule. I'm against the bill. And I hope we can come together on a final resolution of this. Madam Speaker, thank you. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from uh, North Carolina. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll continue to reserve. Continues to reserve the gentleman from Colorado. Madam Speaker, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for one minute. This bill also authorizes a total of $642 billion for defense programs, including $88.5 billion to continue the Afghanistan war on top of the more than $1.3 trillion we've spent thus far. It contains dangerous language that would pave the path for a war with Iran. H.R. 4310 says the U.S. should take all necessary measures, including military action, to prevent Iran from having nuclear technology. This despite the fact that the Secretary of Defense, Panetta, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff have spoken out against a strike in Iran. You know, what's Congress spoiling for another war for? Now, we spend trillions of dollars for war to wage violence thousands of miles away. And, and we become anesthetized to the violence of war against millions of innocent women, children, and men abroad. It's no wonder that we're grappling with how best to deal with domestic violence. Imagine if we took a fraction of the trillions of dollars we spent for war and used it to deal with directly the root causes. Ask for another 15 seconds. 15 seconds. And ask for money to deal with the root causes, the root causes of domestic violence, spousal abuse, child abuse, violence in the school, gang violence, gun violence, racial violence, violence against immigrants, violence against gays. I mean, if we did that and looked at the root causes, we wouldn't even be arguing about spending money for war. We need to look at the issue of violence in America and do it in a consistent, comprehensive Gentlemen, way. Time's expired. I yield back. Time's expired. And the gentlelady from North Carolina. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I yield myself uh, three minutes. The gentlelady is recognized. Madam Speaker, the se as the gentleman from Ohio says, the second bill that's made in order under this rule is H.R. 4310, the National Defense Authorization Act, otherwise known as the NDAA. As we debate this very important bill, let's keep in mind the men and women of the armed forces and their families, and in particular those who've given the ultimate sacrifice in defense of American freedom, which includes this deliberative process of freely debating our laws and ideas about the role of government. We could not be here today without the sacrifices of those who've served in the military and helped protect us as a free people. As James Madison wrote in the Federalist Papers, the operations of the federal government will be most extensive and important in terms of war and danger. Our founding fathers had a clear view that the primary and central job of the United States, of, of our Congress was to deal with these issues. The federal government was to provide for the common defense, which is a constitutional mandate. It is not an issue that should divide us or devolve into partisan rancor, but unite us as a country that supports our military and provides them with the resources necessary to complete their critically important mission. Mr. Madam Speaker, in a few days we'll be in our districts participating in Memorial Day events. I approach Memorial Day with mixed emotions as a part of me celebrates the joy and pride of living in this great country where we're all free to participate in a robust public policy debate. I'm proud that I live in a meritocracy where anyone can choose which path to follow and succeed. But Memorial Day also elicits somber thoughts of those who've given their lives in defense of the greatest country in the history of humankind. While many of our fellow Americans will be celebrating with cookouts and family, I ask that we all pause and think about those families who will have an empty place at their dinner table, those families who still mourn the loss of a loved one, and rather than cooking out, will be visiting our fallen heroes in hallowed grounds across these United States. That's the true purpose of Memorial Day, to pause, remember, and honor those who've given the ultimate sacrifice to preserve all that is great in our country. So as we return home to our districts, I ask all of my colleagues to keep in mind the spouses, children, and families of the fallen. As President Lincoln stated in his second inaugural address, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, 
as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we're in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And with that, Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. General Lady Reserves, the gentleman from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to inquire as to how much remains on, time remains on both sides. The gentleman from Colorado has seven minutes remaining, and the gentle lady from North Carolina has six and a half minutes remaining. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Brown. The gentle lady from Florida is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and members of the House. Uh, as I rise today to speak against this flawed violence against women uh, that the House is presenting, uh, let me point out this picture. This picture is a picture of Melissa Alexander, a 31-year-old master's degree, no prior conviction, received a 20-year sentence for firing a warning shot in the air to warn off an attack by a husband at the time that it occurred, there was a restraining act. This, let me point out that this shot did not injure anyone, yet she will be in jail until 2032. Uh, the imbalance in the system is obvious. Just minutes before she fired the shot, Melissa's husband told her, if I can't have you, no one is going to. Sadly, millions of abused women have heard these exact words and not lived to tell about it. Battered women like Melissa need support and counseling. From Florida. Oh, ladies recognized for 30 seconds. Thank you. Battered women like Melissa need support and counseling so that they don't find themselves in